relational parametricity proofs um, are based in this tutorial on the construction of relational lifting, uh, which tells us how for any given type constructor F and for any relation between um, A and B, so um, by which I mean relation between values of types A and B, um, we construct a new relation, R map F of R, which is between types, uh, between values of types F of A and F of B. Um, it is important that uh, this construction works not only for covariant type constructors, not only for contravariant type constructors, but for any fully parametric type constructors. And we define uh, this operation, the R map, which I call the relational lifting, by induction on the type expression of the type constructor, just like we defined the um, F map or C map for covariant and contravariant type constructors by induction on the type expression. Um, if uh, the type constructor is fully parametric, it means that it is made up of uh, a number of constructions, but we are going to go through each one of them. There are seven constructions. Um, it's a unit type or a fixed type. And in that case, we lift any relation R and the result is an identity relation between K and K, for example, between unit and unit. So the next case is when the type constructor is just the type parameter A, and then the lifting is defined as just the relation R between A and A, uh, between A and B. Uh, the next case is the product, and in that case, we assume that we already have liftings for G and for H, and then we uh, put it on the, uh, the pair product construction uh, to take the pair product of two relations, which are already defined by inductive assumptions. The next case is a co-product where the type is an either of two, and here we use the pair sum construction. Um, in the case of function, we use the pair function map reconstruction. Um, and so I just want to remind you that these constructions were defined um, in the previous part of this tutorial, where we defined exactly what are the relations uh, with, that denoted by p prod, p sum, and p fun. Um, if the type f is defined recursively, then we have some type constructor G with two type parameters. Um, and here, this is how we define uh, the lifting to F. We lift the G, but we lift at the same time two relations with respect to two different type parameters. We lift the relation R, and we lift the relation R map F, which is a recursive invocation of the same lifting function that we're defining. Um, and then we need to lift both of them at the same time. Now, this is a special operation, which I will talk about uh, soon, um, where we lift not one relation, but two relations at the same time to a type constructor with two type parameters. Um, the same we use for the universally quantified type defined like this. So then we also use this um, simultaneous lifting of two relations, which I denoted here by R map two, R map two, except that here we say that this needs to be satisfied for any relation S between any types X and Y. So we in here it is a type that is um, giving you a value for any type X, and here it needs to be a relation that's satisfied for any relation S. So how how does it um, but let me um, clarify how this relation is defined. So um, some values f a f b are in the relation um, for all s r map to g of r s. Um, 
is the same as for OS um, FA, so for OS and between types X and Y, um, FA applied to type X and FB applied to type Y in R map to of RS. So this is a this is an important detail that we have to apply these these values to the type parameters um, before we use this um, um, double lifted relation. So that is the instruction. The result is that you see any type expression R uh, for F is translated into relational combinators in a, in a sense. So for example, um, if you have a, a type, we'll, we'll see an example of this, but uh, have a type that's a code product and the result is a code product of something. And this is recursively done in the same way. So now um, it's important that this definition depends on this construction of lifting two relations at the same time to a typed constructor with two different type parameters. So let me show you how that is defined. So we need to define that actually, this R map tool. We define it in the same way. So for any type constructor with two type parameters in any two relations, we define this lifting with a relation between FAP and FBQ. So you see, um, and we define it by induction. So if it's a fixed type, then it's identity. If f of a p is a, then the lifting is just the first of these two relation, relations. If f of a p is p, then the lifting is the second of these two relations. And then we do the same procedure as before. We just do the combinators, the product, co-product, and function combinators. And for the recursive type, we again do the same thing, except now, if f of a p is defined recursively, it means that there is a type constructor G with three type parameters that is used as a recursion scheme to define f. Lifting to that needs a procedure of lifting of three relations simultaneously to a type constructor with three type parameters. And similarly for the universally quantified type, we need a procedure of lifting of three relations. Um, so we assume that these are already defined, but so then we need to define R map three. We define it in the same way, but that would require us to define R map four and so on. So we actually are obliged to define all of these lifting procedures all at once by induction. And this is not a problem because in practice, any given type expression is finitely long. And so even if it's, um, uh, made from many type parameters quantified, recursively defined, and so on. Eventually, we will have to define some, let's say, RMAP 17, and that would be it. There won't be any more induction in that definition. So then we'll have to just define finitely many uh, RMAP functions, and uh, the induction will stop. So there is no danger of having an infinite loop to define m of four, we need m of five, then of six, seven, and so on to, to infinity. That is, will never happen because any given type expression is going to be a finite type expression. So um, here's an example of applying this procedure to a simple covariant type constructor, which is like this. Um, it's a um, function, so the first step when we apply the inductive definition to this, the first step is um, case five, which is the um, function. So then we have, uh, we have to write, let's for convenience, some names. So we define it like this, where G of A is just R. And that's going to be case one because it's a different type parameter, not depending on A. Um, and then H is a pair AA, which we expand as a pair 
with k of a, l of a, each being a. So then that's each of them with case two. So now we have this case five going into case one, case three, and case two. So now let's we just um, let me compare what happens with defining f map for this type constructor and defining r maps for this type constructor. So f map is actually longer to define. Um, so the function construction looks like this. Then the um, pair construction looks like this. Then the identity, so the case one and case two are easy. They're just identity function or just like this. And so when we put it all together, we have this definition of the F map function for the type P. For the R map, it's just combinators. So it's a pair mapper from this to this. Then the first one gives you identity between R and R. Um, because it's case one. The second one needs to be expanded into a pair product of two of these. And then each one of them is just R because this is an identity functors. So then this is the result. Now, if you compare this with this, you see you can just translate mechanically from here to here. You have a map, pair mapper between identity and the pair product between R and R. So you, um, it's a pretty straightforward procedure, actually simpler to write down this in terms of combinators than to write down this function. But if we um, write down what it means to compute, let's say this function and to compute this relation, um, then it becomes less, less easy because there's this pair mapper, which is not easy. So two values, P and Q, are in this relation. If for any values X and Y of type R, when X and Y is an identity relation, then P of X, Q of X are in this P prod relation, which means that the first parts of them are in R and the second parts are also in R. So this is now, this becomes a little more uh, complicated, but uh, if we choose the relation R to be just a graph or a function, then we, let's say fix some value x, then um, x of type r, then the relation becomes that f of, so the, the graph relation is r, which means that this equals f of this. So f of p of x uh, first part is equal to q of x first part, and so for the second part. And that's actually the same as applying the f map p here to the value p. In other words, the values p and q are in the graph relation of f map p of f. That's how we can write the conclusion. Um, so this shows you that when you use graph relations for, for r, which is a very simple choice, then lifting with the relational lifting, is the same as the graph of just the uh, covariant lifting. Well, this is of course, only when this is a covariant functor. Um, we will see that this is similar um, for any function types, not just um, um, covariant. We'll see how that works. Um, so let's compare how F map and R map work for function types. So in order to see that they are um, compatible with each other, in other, in other words, the definition of R map for function types, which is made with this weird pair mapper um, operation, is actually consistent with the way that we would use F map uh, for um, well, if, if F is covariant and G is contravariant and H is covariant, then F map is defined for this. Then we will now see that it is consistent with how the R map works. So to see that, we will rewrite the F map F by relations. So let, let's choose some values P of this type and F. And then we just put names on the intermediate values. So let's say, f map of f of p is q. So that's going to be a function defined like this. If we define this by relations, it means that p and q are in graph of this function. So what does it mean? 
it means for all GB, the Q of GB is equal to that. So let's define GA, which is this part. And then Q of GB is F map F of P of GA, but that GA actually is equal to, well, um, we define it like this. It means that GA, GB is in this reverse graph relation. And so the relational rewriting of F map F is that P, Q are in this relation is for all GA, for all GB, when they, these are in this relation and those are in this relation. So now we can just see that if we were to replace the graph relation by an arbitrary relation, and if this is re replaced by this as we just motivated, and re uh, so similarly for the contravariant, then this condition that P, Q are in R map of R is exactly the same that the pair mapper gives you for all G, A, G, B. When G, A, G, B are in this relation, then P of G, A, P of G, B are in that relation. So that's the pair function mapper applied to these two relations. So in this way, we have seen that um, the definition of R map through the pair mapper, the pair function mapper is compatible with the definition of F map for function types. So that is uh, just um, kind of a motivation to explain and to, to show how these, uh, these complicated conditions work. Um, and finally, I give a few more examples where um, we use different type constructors of more complicated ones. Um, so for example, if F of A is covariant, then we have always this. And uh, so you can lift the graph relation via, um, via R map. You get the same as a graph of a relation uh, that you have um, lifted via the usual covariant lifting. And it's similar for contravariant, except we have to reverse here because the contravariance C map gives you the function in the opposite direction. But if you take a type constructor like this from A to A, that's neither covariant nor contravariant. And if you lift a graph relation of a function, you get a relation that looks like this. When A, B are in graph of F, then G, A of A, G, B of B are in graph of F. And we can rewrite that. If F of G, A, A equals G, B of F, A, um, which means that there's this equation. So because we, we say B is F of A, so we just eliminate B, so write F of A. Then we can eliminate A and write this in point free style. And that is an equation for functions G A and G B, which has the form of a pullback. Some function of G A equals to some function of G B. So you see, we lifted a simple many to one relation and we got a many to many relation. And that's an interesting thing. So we lift it to a type constructor to which you would not usually be able to lift using F map or C map. And the result is that you had a function that you lifted. Now it's no longer a function. It's a many to many relation. Um, and let's take an example of an even more complicated type constructor. And then we go through this. When P and Q are in this, then H A of P, H A of N are in that. And then we have this condition. If P and then F equals F and then Q, then F of H, A of P equals H, B of Q. And this now means for all P and Q that satisfy this condition, this must be satisfied. This is not in the form of a pullback relation. It is not possible to express P through Q in here. This is a many to many relation between P and Q. And for all of those P and Q, we have this equation. So this is even more complicated. So we lift a simple uh, function graph relation to a complicated enough type constructor, and you get a relation that isn't even expressible in the form of a single equation. You need to write complicated conditions. If for all P and Q something, then something else. So, this happens for sufficiently complicated type constructors and the resulting relations are hard to use because they're neither 
a function graph nor a pullback, they're not expressed in a single equation. So this is just an illustration of what happens when you lift to a type constructor that is sufficiently complicated. Now, um, as an, another example of using relation naturality with uh, non-trivial relations, let us prove that all fully parametric functions with this type signature um, are identity functions. Now, this is a well-known property, but we will just prove it formally using the relational parametricity law. So suppose we have a value T, which has this type, that's denoted by P, this type constructor. It is neither covariant nor contravariant. The relational naturality law says that for any types A and B, and for any relation R, the T of A and T of B are in the lifted relation R map P of R. So let's lift and see what that is. So by lifting, you say R map P is of this type. So it's a relation between functions from A to A uh, to functions from, and, and functions from B to B. And then that's a pair function mapper. Um, so let's uh, write it out. So T and T of B is in this relation is for any A, for any B, if A, B is in R, then T of A, T of B is in R. Now, it's not obvious what to do with this condition. We need to choose some specific relation R, put it in here and see if we can put, if we can make progress with the proof. So let's just, um, well, one trick is to use a very simple relation that is almost never satisfied. Um, choose a relation such that it's satisfied only when both A and B are equal to some fixed value. So they're both of the same type. Let's set A to be equal to B. And so let's just define a relation like this. So for any other A and B, they're not in this relation. Only when A and B are equal and equal both to a fixed value, A zero. So the relational law says when A equals B equals A zero, then T of A must be equal to T of B and must be equal to A zero. That's what it means that these values are in R. So that means for a T of A zero must be equal to A zero um, for any fixed A zero. So that directly shows us that T is an identity function. Um, so as a comment, um, it was not necessary to choose specifically this relation. We could have cho chosen a different relation, uh, say, uh, a function graph of a constant function or something else. But every time it's always a question, well, we have a complicated condition here, which relation shall we substitute into it to be able to make progress? And we don't know in advance. So we need to try. Maybe some of these relations will work and others will not, it's not easy. Um, and one comment finally is that this equivalence, um, the equivalence of this with unit type follows from the unit dilemma. We, I showed this in the tutorial in the previous part of this tutorial where, where um, we were looking at using the parametricity theorem and using naturality laws. So you need the lemma is a, is a powerful shortcut. Uh, let me find this slide where I had a, a lot of examples of uh, uh, simplifying types. Is this here? No. Um, let me try to find the slide. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, it's here. The unit dilemma, and then all these examples here. So, this is the example we were talking about now. Um, it is the um, identity function. But UNEDA tells you right away that this type is equivalent to unit. And because this type is equivalent to unit, um, you know that there's only one value of this type, one distinct value of this type. Um, and identity function is one value of this type. And so you conclude that there's only identity function and no other fully parametric function that you can write on this type. Um, so UNEDA gives you immediately an answer without having to go through the relational neutrality law, without having to lift arbitrary relations, and then try to find specific relations to substitute in here, to make progress, to simplify, and so on. 
um, in many, many cases, um, the needle lemma is sufficient. In some cases, it is not. So that's why the full relational parametricity law is still required in some cases. Uh, although um, for practice, UNIDA is uh, by far the most useful shortcut 